Yep. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Richard Locke. I'm a professor here uh, at Brown in the Political Science Department, and I also are currently serve as the uh, director of the Watson Institute. And it's my great uh, pleasure and honor to be able to uh, welcome you uh, to the Watson Institute and to this very exciting conference on governing uh, climate uh, change. Uh, for those of you who are new to Brown or Watson, um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, what we do. Um, Watson, the Watson Institute, is Brown's uh, Center for International and Public Affairs. And our mission is to promote a just and peaceful world through research, teaching, and public engagement. And our research focuses on understanding and addressing some of the world's great challenges in the areas of development, security, and governance. And it seems to me that climate change is one of, if not the, major challenges of our times. And it's important, especially for our own research program, because it actually intersects uh, very much with our three core areas of, uh, of, of research. Clearly, issues of climate change have major impacts on economic development, growth, alternative paths of that. We're already seeing some of the consequences uh, of climate change, especially on agriculture, but not just agriculture. Uh, it has major consequences uh, for security. If one thinks about the challenges that we're witnessing uh, these days in terms of access to clean water, or the nexus between water, food, uh, energy, uh, the kinds of uh, worries and already uh, initial concerns around migration patterns being provoked by, uh, by uh, climate uh, change. It has major consequences uh, for security and also uh, for governance. For us, governance is how can uh, we think of new ways that the public, but also the public sector working with non-governmental uh, actors, NGOs, faith-based organizations, even the private sector, how can they actually deliver public goods, uh, strengthen the rule of law, strengthen institutions uh, so that our systems can work? And it's very clear, and this is why this conference is so interesting, it's very clear that traditional models of governance especially in the area of climate change, if we just think of sort of the old club of the big countries from the advanced industrial nations, that they seem to be unable, if not unwilling, to actually seriously address uh, the issue of climate change. And this is why this conference is so important, because we need new ideas, new strategies, new approaches to governance of climate change coming from Latin America, but from other parts of the world as well. And we also need to bring together uh, policymakers, students, scholars who want to try to better understand this issue so that we can actually make progress in addressing uh, this uh, issue. Uh, the Watson Institute is extremely excited to partner with the uh, Center for Latin American Studies and Carib Center for Latin American Caribbean uh, Studies and our colleagues on campus who work on environmental change on this important uh, conference. And this is one of the areas of research, of teaching, and of public engagement that we intend to focus on in the years to come. And so we welcome you here, and we uh, look forward to working with you uh, in, uh, in, in the future. I want to just congratulate the conference organizers, uh, Rich and, uh, and Timmons, uh, for putting together just an amazing uh, program uh, to, uh, to be able to bring to campus uh, former uh, current uh, leaders like President Calderon and, and Lagos and so many of the rest of you who have been key players uh, in the climate change uh, negotiation. I just want to uh, offer my words of welcome and my words of thanks uh, and, uh, and look forward to uh, this very interesting uh, work over the course of the day. So thank you. Thanks very much, Rick. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Richard Snyder. I'm the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies here at Brown University. And I want to join Rick in welcoming all of you here to Brown and to the Watson Institute for International Studies, especially our distinguished guests, uh, President Calderon, President Lagos, and uh, Minister Pulgar Vidal from, uh, from Peru, who's joining us today. I also want to welcome everyone who's joining us via live streaming, in particular the alumni 
across all of Latin America of the program on leadership, liberal arts, and public service uh, sponsored by the Botin Foundation of Spain. This program, which is now entering its fifth year, brings about 40 talented young Latin American leaders here to Brown University every year for an intensive week of lectures and seminars with Brown faculty um, and also activities that are geared toward public leadership and public service. So what I want to do briefly is say a little bit about the background and objectives, goals of the conference as I understand them. And then secondly, I want to acknowledge the support of uh, the people and sponsors who made this event possible. So the architecture of this event, I think unlike so many university events, um, this one has real potential to have a genuine impact in the real world. Not that this isn't the real world, but um, it sometimes seems like it's not. Um, and a real and direct impact on one of the most pressing and serious problems facing humanity today, the problem of climate change. Um, I should add that one of the missions of this institute, the Watson Institute, is to bridge the worlds of scholarship on the one hand and policy and practice on the other. So this is a very good fit for this institute. Now there are two reasons why I think this event has the potential to really make a difference. First, the set of people that we've managed to assemble here, and secondly, the timing of the event. To help you understand why the set of participants in this event and the timing of the event seem especially promising in terms of impact, I think it helps to pose the following question. Why are we focusing on Latin America? After all, climate change is a global problem, not a regional one. Well, the answer to the question, why the focus on Latin America, has to do with the region's critical role both as part of the problem of climate change, but also as part of the solution or potential solution to the problem of global climate change. In terms of being part of the problem, Latin America is an important emitter of greenhouse gases, especially carbon. Um, the region has a big and arguably growing carbon footprint. The Amazon, which is not just Brazil, it's 10 countries or so, the Amazon Basin region, um, is ground zero, one might argue, for climate change because of problems of deforestation and uh, degradation. Mining and extractive industries are also part of the problem. Also, Latin America has seen the rise of new middle income and upper middle income countries with new middle classes. And unfortunately, middle classes uh, are not great performers. New middle classes have a big carbon footprint as well, one can argue. Think of Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, Chile, Argentina. These are now upper middle income countries or middle income countries and therefore are a new part of the problem of, of uh, climate change because of their development, their economic development, industrialization. Now what about Latin America as part of the solution to the global problem of climate change? Well, during the last five years, Latin American countries have played an increasingly prominent and central leadership role in environmental diplomacy in efforts to craft a set of institutions that will get countries to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Indeed, a key turning point in international efforts to solve the major global problem of climate change took place in Mexico, in Cancun, Mexico, <coughs> in December of 2010. And in December 2010 in Cancun, the Conference of the Parties, or COP, COP 16, the 16th Conference of the Parties meeting. Now, I'm new to this too. This is environmental diplomacy jargon for those of you who aren't in the know. Many of you are. The COP, in case you didn't know, the Conference of the Parties is the most important event on global climate change that brings together presidents, ministers, and representatives of civil society and also the private sector from nearly all the countries of the world annually um, to try to tackle the problem of climate change. Why was the Cancun conference a turning point for governing climate change? Well, it was in Cancun that 
the, pre, the climate talks at the global level, which had been stalled, especially at the previous year's conference in Copenhagen, Denmark, and people predicted their demise, they were revived. The talks were revived in Mexico, in Cancun in 2010. And we're very fortunate to have with us here today, as participants in this event, some of the key actors who helped make the Cancun event such a success. Uh, former President Calderon of Mexico was the chair of the Cancun conference. We have Ambassador Luis Alfonso de Alba with us today. He was the former, uh, formerly, welcome, Ambassador, formerly Mexico's special representative for climate change. He played a very important role in the Cancun event. And also, uh, we have via live streaming, and I understand that she's joining us now via live streaming, Cristiana Figueres, a Costa Rican diplomat, um, who has served as the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change since May of 2010. These three actors and others played an important role in reviving the global discussions around climate change. So in addition to hosting the pivotal Cancun meeting, Latin America is also part of the solution to the problem of global climate change because it is the home to a number of key <coughs> national leaders who have become important global leaders on climate change. In particular, we have with us today uh, President Ricardo Lagos, the former president of Chile, who after serving as president of Chile, served as the United Nations Special Envoy for Climate Change. Former President Calderon is now chair uh, of a new global commission on the economy and climate. And this is an exciting initiative to explore ways to make economic prosperity and economic development safer for the global climate. It includes former heads of state, uh, leaders in the field of business and economics. And also uh, Cristiana Figueres, as I said, a Costa Rican uh, leader is joining us by live streaming. And she's a, an important leader in, in discussions of global climate change. Okay, this brings me from the set of people who are here to the timing of this event and why I think the timing of the event, in addition to the set of participants, make this conference especially promising in terms of its potential impact. So the next Conference of the Parties event will be hosted by another Latin American country, not Mexico this time, but Peru. And this will be held in Lima, Peru in December of this year. So this is the 20th Conference of the Parties, COP20 in Lima, will be crucial for getting a new binding climate agreement to replace the existing agreement, the Kyoto Protocol, which has essentially expired, as I understand it. So the next major step in international efforts to tackle one of the most pressing problems facing humanity today will take place in Lima, Peru in December. And we're very fortunate to have with us, as participants in the conference, distinguished key members uh, from Peru the Minister of the Environment of Peru, Minister Manuel Pulgar Vidal, is with us today, and also Ambassador uh, Jorge Boto Bernales, who is Peru's representative, special representative for climate change. And we're very excited to be able to bring them, the Peruvians, together with the key architects of the successful Cancun talks, President Calderon, Ambassador de Alba, and uh, Cristiana Figueres. We also have distinguished experts on climate change and environmental diplomacy from Costa Rica, from Colombia, from the Dominican Republic, from the United Kingdom, and from the United States. So I think we've got the human capital ingredients for a very fruitful exchange of ideas and collective learning from prior successes in environmental diplomacy. And hopefully, Brown University offers a, a neutral space for all of the key stakeholders we've assembled to come up with new thinking, new ideas for tackling this pressing problem. Okay, so in terms of the design of the event, one way to think about it is Providence, Rhode Island, specifically Brown University, is a critical link between Cancun and Lima. <laughs> On the road to a more livable and sustainable world for all of us and for future generations. So that's my sense of the design of the event. Let me just quickly acknowledge, because events like this don't happen without lots of people helping. 
and lots of sponsors. It's a multilateral event in the truest sense of the world. So in terms of funding, I want to acknowledge the support of Brown's Center for Environmental Studies, the Climate and Development Lab here at Brown University, our STAR Lectureship Fund, and also the Watson Institute for International Studies, as well as Spain's Botine Foundation. We're grateful for the support of all of these sponsors. And of course, the staff that makes this possible, Kate Goldman, the Outreach Coordinator of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> Guy Edwards, I don't know where Guy is. Guy? I really, in many ways, consider this event to be Guy's brainchild, frankly. Uh, so he deserves an awful lot of the credit. Um, I also want to mention Ramon Stern, who's providing some staff support, and John Mazza and Carrie Fisher um, as well for their help in putting this all together. So again, welcome. Let me turn things over to my colleague Timmons Roberts now. I'm tall. I just learned about this. I didn't know it did this. Let's see here. Where do you get the, uh, I'm a Mac guy too. Slideshow. Where's the little button? Down here, right? Down in the corner? Oh, no, it's going away. That one, right? They make it as small as possible. So thank you, Rick and Rich. Um, welcome everyone, especially our distinguished guests. Uh, former President uh, Calderon and Lagos, really appreciate your traveling. I want to thank everybody for traveling halfway around the uh, Western Hemisphere and some across the ocean, uh, and even from different parts of the United States. The travel was not good yesterday. The, uh, those trying to take airplanes uh, were not happy. So we appreciate your perseverance in getting here. I want to welcome also uh, uh, Minister also, um, and COP president, uh, COP20 president, <laughs> Manuel Purgat Vidal from Peru, and our other esteemed guests. We really have a great lineup. Uh, and I don't want to repeat uh, all of the thanks that uh, Rich gave, but I want to make sure I thank uh, Kate Goldman and, of course, Guy Edwards. You can see I have Guy here uh, with me on this uh, talk. Again, Guy is w the, the mastermind behind the scenes. Um, making this all happen. I want to welcome also my students. Um, thank you all for coming. And I want to thank uh, uh, also the Climate and Development Lab, who are uh, sort of a, an exciting group. We have sort of a, an uh, academic think tank where we combine um, academic projects with real policy relevant research. And we put on these conferences, this is our third, um, over the last four years. Um, I also want to welcome people who are here in live streaming. Um, we uh, know you're out there. We hope you're out there. Uh, we've heard from a lot of people about who are coming. And I want to thank also um, everybody that Rich did, uh, but also President Paxson, uh, the university president, is very interested in this issue and uh, made a, a contribution to help make this possible. Um, in this introduction, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to explain some of our reasons behind this decision to co-organize this conference with Clax. The center director, Rich, is an awesome person to work with. That's enough reason but we decided that it was the topic that we wanted to follow up on and we thought was most timely and where we have sort of a comparative advantage. That is, Brown uh, has strong Latin American studies and it also uh, is a place where uh, we have a few of us who actually care about climate change in Latin America, a, a topic about which there is not that much written, especially not in English. Um, Guy Edwards uh, was the leader in our Climate and Development Lab co-founding intercambioclimatico.com, which is a, a, a multilingual, three-language website uh, devoted entirely to climate change. Uh, so we've worked on that for years. Uh, we also have our own climate and climate dev lab org uh, website that we put out, and we have a lot of material about Latin America and climate change. We were, from the beginning, uh, very much hoping that Peru would be the hosts of the COP20. And our goal really is to be helpful to the, the presidency of, co of the team from Peru. And we hope that uh, we can help uh, them in some way by hosting this event and uh, convening people. 
Um, what else can I say here about that? Um, we've been looking specifically at Latin America since 2010. Uh, as uh, we've sent teams of students and we have uh, postdoctoral fellows in the Climate and Development Lab and myself to the, we go to the COP meetings. Uh, we've had, I think, eight, ten, and then this next year we'll have ten again. We went to Warsaw, Cancun, and uh, where else did we go? Durban, South Africa. This year we'll be going to Lima. Um, we thank everybody who has talked to our lab members at those meetings, and we want to thank people in the future for meeting with us. We've been very lucky uh, with uh, and uh, gifted, really, with the time that people have spent. We appreciate it very much. And we hope that this conference is a little bit easier than the COPs in terms of the hour of the night that we're going to end. We're going to try to keep very much on our schedule today. Uh, we have especially Christiana Figueres' uh, talk at 11 a.m., so we need to be right on time with that. And we have a very ambitious program to keep on. Um, so again, thank you all for coming. So our research questions, uh, and these are part of a, a book that Guy and I are co-authoring with a lot of assistance from the Climate and Development Lab members, um, is to try to understand Latin America and uh, how this region uh, can be considered um, leaders on the issue of climate change. We've also focused on um, sort of the relationships of Latin America with the European Union, with the United States, and with uh, China. Uh, so we're trying to, to understand each of those pieces in turn. Um, and we call those the three hungry giants, uh, playing off a Raymond Vernon book, which was called Two Hungry Giants uh, from a couple decades ago. Uh, we're talking about these three hungry giants looking to Latin America, often for fossil fuels, for mineral products, for manufactured goods, and so on. That there is, in fact, uh, uh, this history in Latin America, of course, of uh, extraction of natural resources. And we, we think that that's closely related to the region's uh, ability uh, to be a leader on climate change in the future. So our four research questions are, um, what does climate change mean for Latin American economies, societies, and foreign policy? What are the roots of Latin American positions on climate change? Uh, where does this leadership come from? Uh, what, are, what does that mean for its enduring political will to take action? Um, how does that bold action come about, and what are the forces uh, that work against it? Uh, and can Latin American models, which we think are quite, many of them, very progressive, original, uh, creative solutions to urban and development needs of nations, can they be models applied elsewhere in the world? We believe that many of them can, but we, uh, we know that models sometimes travel well and sometimes don't. Um, Latin America is important to understand a bit of its vulnerability to climate change. A report by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, on the 31st of March, just uh, Monday, two weeks ago, uh, and then this, that was Working Group 2, and then Working Group 3, of course, released this report this last weekend, have illustrated how Latin America and the Caribbean are particularly vulnerable to some of these climate impacts. Um, so I'll address them very briefly here. As the slide shows, these include the potential collapse of the Caribbean coral biome uh, because of uh, acidification of oceans, rising water temperatures, intensification of weather patterns and storms and sea level rise, a great problem especially in the Caribbean, uh, increasing flooding and droughts from uh, more intense rainfall events, something we're seeing also in the northeast of the United States. Warming of the high Andean ecosystems, which of course threatens uh, glaciers and uh, snow cap, and which is a great source of uh, drinking water and irrigation water. Uh, increased, increased exposure to tropical diseases uh, as temperatures rise and humidity changes. Uh, Raise, expand the areas that are hospitable to uh, mosquitoes and other vector-borne diseases, and uh, the risk of dieback of the Amazon rainforest ecosystem. This is the largest sort of potential tipping point, as uh, the Potsdam Institute uh, on Climate uh, reports have put it, these important tipping points in the world, uh, as we've seen some big droughts in the Amazon uh, in the last 10 years, uh, which uh, put that area uh, quite at risk because of its uh, 
being a huge stock of carbon dioxide um, that could be released. In fact, disturbingly, some of these droughts have made it so that in 2012, Peru, the Peruvian Amazon became a net emitter of carbon dioxide rather than an emitter of the oxygen for the first time as a result of these droughts. Um, glacier melt is also important for uh, water supplies in Colombia, Bolivia, Peru, and Ecuador, as well as taking its toll on power uh, production uh, with uh, increasing droughts, putting at risk uh, the hydroelectric power, which really makes uh, Latin America a quite different region than much of the rest of the world in terms of its profile of where its electricity comes from. So the very thing that makes Latin America so efficient is also the thing that puts Latin America at risk. That is, will there be water in the reservoirs? Um, let's see. In 2013, the Inter-American Development Bank has stated that estimated damages in the region caused by the impacts of climate change uh, associated with about 2 degree rise in Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit over pre-industrial levels are estimated to reach about 100 billion dollars a year by 2050. A hundred billion dollars a year by 2050. Uh, it's, these are, of course, very tough numbers to come up with, and it depends on which sectors you include and so on. And then it's worth mentioning also the UN Development Programs report, uh, which has talked about how climate change presents a challenge to hard-won development gains. Decades of development may be rolled back because of climate change, and it's deepening this divide between the rich and the poor. Uh, an effort which has really uh, been the center of a lot of Latin American development uh, in the last 20 years. And it would be uh, a threat also to reverse advances in health and education for the most vulnerable. So why Latin Americans should not be ignored? The region is a biodiversity superpower. You've heard all this before, I'm sure, about its including uh, these huge different diverse biomes, um, it's, so these also play an important part it's in, with its economic growth. The region includes a quarter of the planet's arable land and 22% of its forest areas and some of the most biodiverse countries in the world. Its, Latin, uh, its emissions are about 11% of global total of, car of carbon dioxide equivalents. Um, so it's not a huge emitter, but as Rich said, it's increasing. Um, in interestingly, Brazil is the largest, uh, approximately 50% of the emissions from the region, although uh, some of that was the, accounted for by deforestation in the Amazon, which has been on the decrease until 2013. Um, following that is uh, Mexico with about 12% of regional emissions, Venezuela 8 and Argentina 7. Greenhouse gases from land use such as deforestation have traditionally been the main sources of the region's emissions, which makes Latin America different, uh, a different point that President Lagos often has made as he's visited my classes and uh, I think really helps to understand why the region is so different. Um, let's see, there's also a, a large growth in emissions right now from transport uh, and from power generation as the region is um, seeing economic growth. Uh, and I've talked some about, uh, let's see, uh, hydropower, uh, which again is about 60 or 70 percent of emissions. So going forward, Latin America's ability to keep its emissions down while continuing to develop presents a considerable challenge. Uh, Latin America is also thirdly a bellwether for the wider UN climate change negotiations. That is, um, these countries don't speak with one voice. There has never been uh, an effective Latin American, there is the GRULAC, the group of Latin American and Caribbean countries, but it's not really a negotiating block. There are many. Um, <coughs> for example, um, there is uh, Brazil as a member of BASIC, the group of four countries, Brazil, South Africa, India, and China, that is the BRICS without Russia. Um, and so Brazil is often negotiating separately from the rest of the region. Um, there's Mexico, which is a member of the Environmental Integrity Group, uh, which is an earlier group, it's been around for a long time, with South Korea and Switzerland. Uh, we also have uh, Venezuela, Bolivia, Ecuador, and a few other countries negotiating as part of a group called ALBA, or the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our Americas. Um, so that's a, a group that's been a focused a lot on climate, uh, climate justice. 
And um, some of those countries have also negotiated with the like-minded group, another new group uh, uh, led by India and China, which is focused on uh, making sure that the phrase common but differentiated responsibilities, which comes from the 1992 uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, continues to include an understanding that the wealthy countries need to act first on climate change. Um, and then there's also um, Colombia, Peru, Costa Rica, and Chile making up what we think is a very exciting new negotiating group called ILAC, the Independent Association of Latin America and Caribbean Countries, ILAC, A-I-L-A-C. Um, and we're going to hear a lot more about that group. That's really kind of the focus of our whole conference is to understand ILAC and to uh, understand what it's possible for it to do. So now I'm down to the fourth point here. Um, Latin America as a game changer in the UN uh, climate change negotiations. Even though they don't speak with one voice, the countries have played significant roles. Brazil has been an important part of uh, designing the Kyoto Protocol in uh, 1997. ALBA countries were important in making uh, uh, the Copenhagen Accord not sail through um, uh, due to transparency and respect for UN procedures in Copenhagen. Um, and they were concerned also about its scientific uh, adequacy to address dangerous climate change. In 2010, of course, as Rich pointed out, Mexico played a pivotal role in, in some many people say, in saving the multilateral process looking for a global solution to climate change. Um, and then now we have these, uh, we're now following the Durban Platform for Enhanced Action uh, negotiated in 2011, largely with some leadership from the uh, Latin American countries, including Mexico and these ILAC members. Okay, I'm getting to the end here. Um, so is Latin America a potential model for action? There are national pledges and domestic policies which have to be mentioned. Uh, many people don't know this about Latin America, but these countries have been leaders. Peru was the first developing country in the world to announce a voluntary emissions reduction pledge all the way back in 2008, offering to reduce to zero its net deforestation of primary forests by 20, 2020, 2021 and to produce 33% of its total energy by renewable sources by 2020. That's one of the most ambitious renewable, as we call them, portfolio standard uh, in the world. Still, so Peru is at the front. Brazil established national greenhouse gas reduction targets, uh, roughly about 36% uh, of its um, projected emissions by 2020, largely based on uh, reducing deforestation. Mexico was the first developing country to create a comprehensive climate change law in 2012, a major piece of legislation uh, led by some of the people in this room, uh, uh, President Calderon, uh, and with targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 30% by 2020 and 50% by 2050. Costa Rica pledged in 2008 to become a carbon neutral by 2021. That's a bold pledge. Uh, and and we hope uh, it's one that uh, can be carried out. Ecuador is also taking action on climate change at home by reducing emissions through the expansion of clean energy, improving forestry protection, and so on. And there are many other actions that are taking place at home and other pledges. Uh, and then secondly, there's key players. Uh, many of them are in the room here, and we're uh, very excited to have you here. And I don't want to repeat what Rich did for the, matter, for the sake of time, because we are now behind time. So quickly, um, there are some concerns about uh, whether Latin American leadership uh, may be under threat. For example, some countries uh, have these climate change strategies, um, but then there has been some worrying examples which demonstrate that there are difficulties in implementing those policies. And there are facts that Latin American governments have competing priorities. As administrations change, as there are economic crises, as there are um, increasing, um, we, we worry about the increased uh, reliance on fossil fuel exports and other um, uh, sort of raw materials, um, dependency in, in foreign exchange, um, if that in, in fact somehow influences country's um, profile and efforts on climate change. And so for some time, I'm going to skip a little bit. I don't know what happened with that. I think that's the Mac to uh, 
won. Um, so our goals for the conference are to assess Latin American leadership on climate change and to what conditions, what conditions it needs and uh, provide a platform for, to support that. So we'd, again, we'd like to help out the delegation. You've seen the program for the rest of the day. I'm going to skip over that. Two, um, provide a neutral space for frank discussion and constructive dialogue to help build trust, we hope. We trust that the UN negotiations is very low. Um, however, there are countries from both Latin America and around the world who are attempting to build confidence and encourage greater ambition by all countries. In this spirit, we hope that at least to make a minor contribution to help improve trust and dialogue between participants. And thirdly, we'd like to encourage ambition and attention to equity, the core issues um, in the negotiations. As the UN, uh, the Intergovernment, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reported just this Sunday, our time is running out to address this issue. They pointed out that we need to have uh, major efforts undertaken in the next 15 years. Uh, but under the framework established in Durban, we really have uh, really until the next December, so 18 months, um, to negotiate a deal um, to get us to what's needed to be done. So the science of climate change is increasingly clear. We either put the brakes on now to reduce emissions or we suffer potentially catastrophic crashes in the, in the coming years. That will be much more expensive to clean up. So I think many of us here today would agree that Latin America has at times played a decisive leadership role to confront climate change and with Peru hosting and with Latin American countries putting greater focus on the issue, this leadership is more needed than ever. So thank you all for coming and I'm going to now hand the microphone back to my valued friend and colleague Rich Snyder who is uh, an amazing director of a very vibrant Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. So thank you all for coming again. Okay, I'd like to invite uh, President Largos and President Calderon um, up to the front of the room. So, actually, we should have you over here. Oh my God! <laughs> Wait a second. That's a bad chair. That one it's a good one. Well, thank you, everybody. So we are now 30 minutes uh, behind schedule. Um, we are not guilty about that, you know? <laughs> Which, uh, you know. Nobody moderate the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what I think I, I'm going to do, usually I have uh, an extended introduction of distinguished guests. Um, I've got about five minutes for President Lagos and five minutes for President Calderon. <coughs> but since we are 30 minutes behind schedule, I'm going to have to shorten things. And I'll do so by mentioning my favorite tombstone in the world. At Yale University, there's a cemetery, the, the Grove Street Cemetery. And I happened to be wandering around and came across a wonderful uh, marker. And it was uh, a fellow named Lars Onsager, um, a deceased uh, professor of chemistry. Um, at Yale, died in 1981, and it said Lars Onsager, 1899, 1981, and then underneath his name, um, and actually next to his name, there was an asterisk, like a footnote kind of thing. So what's that? You go down to the bottom of the stone, and back up. So Lars Onsager said Nobel laureate, asterisk, etc. Nobel laureate, etc. So in the interest of saving time, I will say. Ricardo Lagos, former president of Chile, etc., and Felipe Calderon, former president of Mexico, etc. Okay? Okay. How does that work? Good. Thank you. And we'll start with uh, President Lagos. And I'll ask each of you 20 to 25 minutes, please, if we can.
Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Well, I would like to thank this opportunity to talk uh, on this, uh, I think, uh, quite a crucial seminar at the time that is taking place, this seminar. Because I think that uh, all of us here in the room know how difficult has been these negotiations. All of us here in this room know that we failed in Copenhagen and that we failed in order to have a, a new protocol after Kyoto expired. And at the same time, as was just remembered, science has told us that uh, things are a little bit more urgent than what they used to be when we <coughs> start thinking that was possible to have a Kyoto, a post-Kyoto agreement in 2009. And needless to say that all of us know also that if we don't take action today, as Laura Stern has uh, remembered us, action taken tomorrow is going to be much more expensive than the action that we are going to take today. So it's very clear what science has said, that we human beings are responsible for global warming. Well, it's difficult to speak about global warming if we are in the middle of spring in New England and yesterday we have snow. <laughs> but other than that, let's say global change and weather change. But after saying this, the fact that we human beings are responsible is out of the question. And therefore, the question is how long we can keep the principles and the agreements. Why? Because the principle of all of us are responsible, but we have different responsibilities, is correct. There is no question on that. The problem is, I think, that the Kyoto Protocol in 98 make a crucial distinction between Annex 1 and non-Annex 1, and Annex 1 is the developed world at that time, and non-annex was the developing world at that time. And the distinction is crucial in the sense that develop has to fulfill the promises, and developing, since they are developing, well, let's see what they can do. And let's urge them to do something, but it's not compulsory. And all of us know how difficult the negotiations are because of the question of the historical responsibility. Yes, it's true. Today's emission will remain in the atmosphere for the next 110, 120 years. And therefore, in today's atmosphere, the last, what happened during the last 110 or 120 years, what countries are responsible for what you have there? <coughs> and then the question is, well, if United States is responsible for about 29% of total emissions in the atmosphere, uh, some countries like Germany about 8%, I understand, or something like that, et cetera, et cetera. And China, by the way, now is very rapidly uh, close to 5% of what you have in the atmosphere. So when you are in the negotiation room and somebody will tell you, look, sir, you are not going to tell me what to do because you are responsible for the 29%. When I am responsible for the 29%, then we can discuss. Otherwise, I'm entitled to emit also my own 29%. Period. That's impossible. But this is the real world and this is the kind of negotiation that we already have on the table. So. The reason why I think that it's so important trying to break this kind of argument from side to side. And the first principle, I think, is, is true. That uh, this distinction in 98 of Annex 1 and non-Annex 1 is going to be a crucial part of the discussions. How long can we keep that distinction? Until what extent is fair to keep that distinction? distinction? Because it seems to me that, as uh, Dick uh, said very recently, <coughs> 16 years ago, nobody thought that Latin America was going to be where we are now. Either because we feel rather with a little bit more confidence in ourselves, 
because it's the first time that there is a crisis and we are not responsible for that crisis, you see? <laughs> so it's, uh, that gives us a sense that uh, here we are, you know. Uh, the tequila crisis, of course, was uh, yesterday, but not today. And the fact that this is the case, and we are a little bit proud because we are middle-income countries and keep growing, well, but at the same time, Africa, Africa, most African countries are converging, if we accept the denomination of OECD, and by convergent countries are those countries that are able to have a growth rate that is twice <coughs> the growth rate of OECD countries. So they are converging in the long run. And there you have Africa. And Africa is a, a crucial player in this area. In short, what I'm trying to say is till what extent is possible to keep the distinction and annex one and non-annex one, until what extent some new categories will have to be introduced, or at least if you want to keep those categories, let us accept that if all of us are responsible, all of us has to be accountable for some of our pledges. <laughs> President Calderon, was in Copenhagen in that incredible meeting of uh, 20 or 20,000 head of state in that room. And could you think Mr. Putin and Mr. Obama, Mr. Sarkozy and Madame Merkel, Mr. Calderon and Mr. Lula trying to write a draft of a negotiation at the same time? And Mr. Obama arrived at 10 o'clock that morning, saw what was going on the discussion. I say, I'm sorry, but given this document, no matter how much political capital I have, I cannot accept this because I cannot sell this in the United States, period. And at that time, President Obama has a lot of political capital. And this was the discussion. And at the end, what happened? if we are talking about uh, political leadership. At the end, what happened was a very quick understanding between <coughs> President Obama and the so-called uh, basic countries, because Russia was not in that room. And that was it. <coughs> but I think, I had never talked this with President Calderon, but I think that the fact that President Calderon was in that room, and he knew that the next COP meeting was going to be in Mexico, Probably that's the reason why I discovered later that I've never seen a president so much involved in a COP conference like President Calderon. And the decision that they took in advance that never again is going to be accepted in a conference like that, that the country stand up and say, I veto. And President Calderon and his uh, foreign minister, Madame Patricia Espinosa decided that when somebody wanted to say, I veto, the answer was, as far as we know, the United Nations Charter considered veto only at the Security Council. <laughs> and we have a substantial majority here, and the proposal is approved. And that, we are talking about political leadership, that's political leadership, because they knew in advance what they are going to do if that happened. And in that case, now, if you have a substantial majority, you can go ahead and you finally can get an agreement. After that, then I think that now again is Peru the one that is going to have the <coughs> conference. And all of us know that Peru is the last instance before Paris. And for Paris, we need to have another protocol. And the big issue is to what extent because we, don't, we cannot repeat what happened in Copenhagen when we have a draft with only 200 brackets. <laughs> only 200, you know. Yeah. And, and the president were confident that they Sherpas and they advisors and so on that used to work during the first two weeks, they are going to end up most of the bracket. And the fact was that after working during two weeks, instead of 200, you have 400 brackets at the time that the presidents arrived. 
that's the real world. 400 brackets. So now we all know that what happened in Peru is going to be essential to see what's going on in Paris. And when I think that things are different, I think that things are different, and I guess Hilak is extremely important. The fact that you have uh, uh, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Panama, Peru, Colombia, and Chile as an informal group. And what we are trying to say there is, look, if it is possible to accept, because one of the consequences of Copenhagen was that every country, in a voluntary basis, is going to tell and is going to register what are the plans that they plan to do for the next year vis-a-vis -vis mitigation and reduction of emissions. And that's it. And then it was say, if it is possible, if this is what you present in a voluntary basis, that all of us, countries in this room, can make compulsory that you have to fulfill what you say you are planning to do. If it is possible this, that on a voluntary basis, you say, I am planning to reduce emission by so much, or I'm planning like Costa Rica to to say that they're going to be carbon neutral in 2021. Okay, wonderful. But is it is possible then to make accountable? If it is possible then to forget about the Annex 1 and non-Annex 1 and to say, look, all of us are going to be responsible for what on a voluntary basis? That would be a tremendous advance, in spite of the fact that once that you add all the voluntary commitments, according to Sir, today Lord Nicholas Stern, he made the calculations and told us that we are still far away from the target. And therefore, when you add all the compromise made by all countries on a voluntary basis, if all of them fulfill those uh, promises, still we are going to be far ahead of what we need to do. But at least, we will start with something. In short, I think that this proposal by these countries from Latin America uh, is going to be an important part in the negotiations if we are able to introduce this idea. I know that it's difficult. I know that the G77 plus China, most of the countries belong to G77 and plus China, they still wanted to keep like some sort of a building wall that cannot be destroyed, the distinguishing between Annex 1 and non-Annex 1. But let us be serious. I think that the time has come to be able to face this issue. And therefore, I would like to think that it's going to be possible to take actions if it is possible to advance <coughs> understanding that the Annex 1 and non-Annex 1 has to be overcome. The real challenge, the real challenge, to understand where we are now, the real challenge is that in 2050, we are going to be 9 billion people, and that uh, 9 billion people cannot emit more than two tons per person in 2050. And in today's world, this country emits uh, 22 tons, more or less, per person, in Europe between 10 to 12, Latin America about five to six, China five, India close to two, a little bit more than two, Russia about uh, eight, Australia about eight. So it's a big challenge. How are we going to be able to reduce emissions per capita, but at the same time, I think that in the future of this 21st century, the paradigm of the 20th century was, tell me, what is your per capita income? In the 21st century, they will tell you, oh, congratulations, now you are close to 20,000 per capita income. But tell me, what is your per capita emission? And that is going to be the justice to measure how civilized is a country. And therefore, I think that here we have something to, to take care of. <coughs> Until what extent, then, is going to be possible to have progress in this particular area. 
In short, if it is possible to make the voluntary commitment at least accountable for everybody, then I think it would be a very important step forward. Number two, and I would like to stress this because I think it's crucial from the point of view of Latin America. As uh, <coughs> it was just remembered uh, by you in a sense of what about the question of deforestation? Why I mention deforestation? Because as was mentioned before, total emissions, deforestation is 20% at the world level, close to 18 to 20. But total emissions in Latin America, 49% is because of deforestation. 29, uh, excuse me, 49%, almost 50% is deforestation. It's true, the Amazonian is so important. But the question is that, I remember once talking with uh, President Lula on this issue, and I mentioned the question of deforestation. And Lula said to me, Lagos, what can I do when a peasant in the Amazon cut a tree because he also wants to have warm food at least once in a week. <laughs> and then, I, I, now I can answer to President Lula and say, look, after the only agreement, important agreement in financial terms in Copenhagen was the Red Plus. The fact that now you are going to pay a country, not only if you plant a tree, that used to be before, but if you don't cut a tree. And this, I think, it would be a very important issue from the point of view of the region. If 50% of our emissions is deforestation, and we have some funding and financing vis-a-vis -vis the issue, how much will you depart from the business as usual, because you keep deforesting, and how much are you going to be able to reduce deforestation, and therefore, how much you are going to be entitled to this new fund? And then I can give an answer to President Lula now to can provide with the new funding to reduce deforestation. Final point with regard to the issue of forestation, and it's not because it's, it's my country, but in, in Latin America there are three countries, Uruguay, Argentina, and Chile, that because of the policy of forestation, or if you want it because of reforestation, we are able to absorb every year emissions because of the new uh, trees that has been planted. I don't like to say this in Chile, and I never say this, because we emit about uh, uh, total numbers, 70 million tons per year. If you divide by the number of people, it's about five or something. But because of reforestation in Chile, we absorb about half of that. And reforestation has been a policy during many, many years, during the last 40 years. <coughs> so that means that reforestation allows us to absorb a substantial part of our emissions. Therefore, when you introduce the question of forestation, deforestation, and reforestation, then you have something very peculiar from the point of view of Latin America. And therefore, it may be possible from the point of view of Latin America to present a different kind of thinking. And I think, and it's a pity that in this meeting is not uh, Brazil, because I think that since most of the emissions are taking place in the Amazon, it would be so important a leadership from the point of view of Brazil because can you imagine if Latin America made the offer? Look, we offer to reduce deforestation during the next uh, uh, 10 years. We are going to reduce deforestation <coughs> by, let's say, 50% during the next 10 years. Well, that's 3%, roughly, that we are going to be able to reduce total emissions by 25%. It's not bad for the next 10 years. I mean, and this depends, there is money, there is financing, 
And I think that uh, is Brazil is in a position to lead, given the, the role that Brazil plays in terms of deforestation. By the way, in the case of Brazil as a country, all the emissions of the Brazilian economy are smaller than the emission because deforestation in the Amazon. Can you think about that? <laughs> the, 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 the country that is the, the sixth economy or the seventh economy in the world, all the emissions of that economy during one year is less than the emission from deforestation. So that's why it's so important, this issue. And this is what I do believe that is possible to have a viable <coughs> political alternative from the point of view of Latin America vis-a-vis -vis what ILAC has been doing and vis-a-vis -vis if we introduce the question of deforestation. And, and I think that the leadership of Peru is going to be extremely important in what's going to happen next December. And, and I'm sure that they understand quite well the challenge that it, we have and why it would be an important contribution for Lat the Latin American countries vis-a-vis -vis what should be the negotiations. I know that is going to be difficult, but at the same time, I think that it's extremely important to understand that things have changed, not only from the point of view of uh, capita income or middle income countries, but also how, how much has been the advances in technology. Uh, how much these advances in technology allow us to think in a different way of what we used to think in 98. In today's world, in most of our countries, even the prices of energy, solar energy, our eolic energy, is becoming more and more competitive with the fossil fuels, and therefore it's a different question. The way that has been going down the cost of uh, solar panels is amazing. China now is the number one producer and exporter and the number one advances in technology. And therefore, here there is something also to put into the negotiation table. And therefore, the question of intellectual property rights, transfer of technology, financing, etc., etc., are going to be an essential part of the negotiation. So, I would say, those developed countries will have to be responsible also in terms of financing and transfer of technology. There is no question on that. The only thing that I'm trying to say is that it's going to be essential from developing countries to put on the table, on the negotiation table, some kind of agreement to be accountable for the promises that we have made. And if you have the linkage, I think that it's possible to have a breakthrough. As far as the historical responsibility, the only thing that I would like to say that because of technology, nobody is entitled to say, I will follow the same path that you followed 100 years ago. Because technology is quite different today from 100 years ago. And therefore, I don't think that it's fair to say, I'm entitled to emit so much because you did that 100 years ago. So it has to be some kind of equilibrium in these kind of negotiations. Uh, and probably an advantage of the former president is that we can speak much clearer than we can do it when you are president, and you are responsible for what you say. Mm -hmm. But here, there are many people in this room that are still in the negotiation table, and I think that it may be fine sometimes trying to speak from what I do really believe in this issue. What is very clear that up to now, the political leadership is failing. We have been unable to produce a new protocol. I hope that political will, will prevail and we will have a draft of the protocol at the end of Lima conference and to be ready to finish that in Paris in uh, 2015. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President Lagos. President Calderon? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, basically, uh, I will skip some of my slides. I want to express my gratitude to Brown University for these invitations. But, you know, basic, the basic thing. So you analyze the events just in this academic year. In Brown, see the words of the most devastating typhoon in the Philippines. Uh, the extreme winter in the U.S. In New York, for instance, is the worst in 100 years. Uh, the floods in the UK, the wettest December in Scotland on records, or this, the most severe the drought in California ever, the driest year on record, and which ha it has a tremendous impact, for instance, in the price of foods right now and the, the, the life of the people there. So the point is, clearly, we need to go through all the basics again. We need to say to the people what exactly is happening. Global warming is the root of this. That is, the, you can see in red, uh, the increase in temperature in the last century over the average uh, in, in blues. There are some dots in blue in which is the, the other way around. But basically, the, the earth is, uh, is getting, getting hotter. You can see the, the last three decades have been the hottest decade on record since 8050. Uh, and, uh, and that's part of the report of the IPCC this month. So the point is, what is clear is, this is you can see the measures of the sea level, which is uh, actually increasing due to climate change, global warming, I'm sorry, first. So you know very well the basics. And we need to remember the people that all those phenomena are associated with carbon emissions. Just to talk about uh, the performance of carbon emissions, since I was born, uh, CO2 emissions of fourfold in my lifetime, four times. And if you go back to 50s, it's six times. So it's, it's getting worse. And it's a clear correlation between carbon emissions and global temperature. And depending on the forecast of emission, we will have either uh, two degrees or four Celsius degrees at the end of this century. So those are the basic. And the basic idea is it's the current policy scenario, and we need to move towards new policies and even the ideal policies regarding to curve the emissions in order to get only a maximum of two degrees that we agreed in Cancun. So everybody knows about that, but uh, what can we do? And that is the reason about our effort we are doing in the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate. The people, honestly, between us, global leaders and businessmen and presidents and prime ministers and congressmen, they don't care about climate change, honestly. A lot of people would say, uh, Mexico, very bad expression. I will not to repeat because my mother told me never <laughs> say that kind of words. But uh, the point is they don't care. Why, if the scientific evidence is so clear, we are not taking the right measures? And the point is we need to change the strategy to persuade the people and the leaders in the business community and the political leaders to take the right decisions. What could be that strategy? And I will quote that very famous says in the Clinton and Clinton campaign, when his team was deciding the political strategy, somebody said, it's the economy, stupid. No, <laughs> no my friends, uh, it's the economy, stupid. And we need to change the arguments. And what we need to do is to provide key elements that are able to demonstrate that it is possible to get economic growth and fighting climate change. The main obstacle that we are facing is, for most of the leaders, especially after this terrible crisis we had, to take responsibility, as President Lagos was saying, implies a lot of economical Cost. So I'm not going to reduce the economic growth. Uh, do this idea that this President Lagos is saying, because I'm president, when I want to win the next elections. I, I don't want to, pro to propose to, the peop to my people to reduce economic growth, and so on. Yes, there is a dilemma, but we need to what? That is a false dilemma. And the goal we have in the Global Commission of the Economy and Climate is to produce, but this September, a report in which we want to demonstrate that that is a false dilemma. Therefore, there is a way in which we can get economic growth, poverty alleviation, and of course, 
responsible behavior towards the environment. So it is possible to tackle climate change, and it is possible to tackle poverty on, and create jobs. So how can we do that? So what, what, what we are exploring is a group in which President Lagos, one of the most admired for me presidents and leaders in the world currently, and other former leaders like Jens Stoltenberg, former prime minister of Norway, or people coming from business sector like Paul Polman, CEO of Unilever, or Mr. Holiday, CEO of Bank of America, uh, people, CEO of Bloomberg, and others. Uh, and of course, the co-chair of the commission is Nick Stern, people uh, leading the economic team. The idea is to go through the economic arguments to provide the community with the right economic arguments. Also, our point is like this. Scientists have rested their case already. Is that clear? We cannot go beyond. Beyond the point that the APCC demonstrated, it's, it's a question of faith. It's not a question of science. And the question of faith is, do you believe in climate change or not? So we cannot go there. Uh, for the Republicans and the markets, it's like a question of faith. Now, come on, it's not a question of faith, but we cannot go beyond. So are you concerned about the economy? About your concern about the jobs? Let's do with jobs. And that is the goal of the commission. And what are basically the ideas, very quickly, uh, due to time? We need to go through several, several, uh, can, I, can I borrow my, my paper? I forgot that. I'm sorry. I do this all the time. But, uh, we say the accordion in Spanish, but anyway. <laughs> we can do trying to change the part of the economy in several ways. One, we need to go first with the, I would say, the, the low harm fronts. We need to invest in no regret measures. What is that? It's amazing. The key issue is at least half of the effort we need to make, it is possible to do even without paying any economical costs. How is that? So there is a very famous, I know it's controversial, but quite, quite famous, um, sorry. How can I do that? Well, this is a very famous uh, graph. So you can see in this axis. The, uh, it's a correlation with carbon emissions. So, I'm sorry, it's a, it's, it's a question of cost. What is the cost to take this measure, for instance? Let me take uh, nuclear. This is estimated that nuclear in some time implies like a positive economic cost. But it, and of course, it's correlated with in the horizontal is the number of the capability of those measures to reduce carbon emissions. But let's say, let me talk only about cost, about economic cost. What is curious is all these activities in the left side, they have negative net present value cost. And what that means, my dear friends, net negative net present value cost, negative cost, imply real business, imply money, profits, jobs, and economic growth. And if we do all those activities through the right public policies to, as a clear incentive to the society and business, to do this, we can make a real change on that. Let me give you one example. Appliances, which is, why is so positive in economic terms? Because you, all of us, when we were married, so the people who are married, so, <laughs> so the refrigerators were very intensive in energy consumption, like three or four times that current refrigerator. If you change your refrigerator for a new one, you will have less consumption, less electricity bill, and less carbon emissions. So it's a win-win situation. What we did in Mexico, for instance, at that plan, we organized a plan in order to provide a small subsidy for poorest families with affordable credit in order to substitute the refrigerators. Actually, the, the program was, the name of the program was really boring. When the minister came, tell me, President, the name would be something like saving energy program in appliances, domestic appliances, blah, 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 blah. blah. <laughs> That's really boring. Let me think. So we, the Mexicans, say to the, the wives, call us the husband, mi viejo, or my old man, my old, no, my old, so my old one. So the program, the name of the program was Cambia tu viejo por uno nuevo. <laughs> so change your old one for a new one. It was fantastic, yes. 
Let me say, some ladies were a little bit disappointed when they arrived to the store to see what exactly the program was about. <laughs> but at the end, we sold one million and a half refrigerators, saving a lot of energy for the families and a lot of money for the families and for the government. So that's, if you analyze a lot of this question, other is not appearing here because the British who prepared these people from McKenzie don't know very well the example of Chile. Chile has a fantastic example of success in forestry, as the president was saying. It's a real business. You can plant trees, and you can get a lot of money, and at the same time, you can sequestrate. You can capture carbon emissions. And it, it doesn't appear here. I don't know why. So there are some uh, issues related with degraded forest reforestation, but it's not exactly the same. I'm talking about real business, but I can pass hours and hours, but let me, let me skip this. this other example, the next Nest is a company that uh, is providing this quite fancy thermostat that are saving billions of kilowatts hour. And at the same time, the company is getting a lot of value. So Google bought Nest for 3.2 billion recently. So companies providing solutions with carbon emission reductions are getting real business and real profits. That's the kind of things that we need to think about in order to provide alternatives to the debate. Other, second question, design better cities. As the President Lagos was saying, by the year 2050, we will be, I hope we will be there, yeah. like 9 billion people. Where all those billion people will live? They will live in cities. Somebody is estimating that only in the next 25 years, more than 1.5 billion people will live in cities. That implies to build more than 1,000 cities of 1 million people, completely new. So all those people will live in some cities. And what could be the right way to do those cities? It's going to be like this American style in which every, everyone wants to have their own front garden and backyard and very big houses or whatever. And the highways, you, know, you need to drive a lot of, it's the case of Mexico City as well, but it's very expansive, or lack of density cities. Is that the model for the future? Of course not. If we are going to build 1,000 cities of 1 million people at least, we need to do in a different way. Let's see <clears throat> the perspective of this. One is this explosion, which is good news, of global middle class, uh, that it was uh, in the 90s only 1 billion people. Three years ago, four years ago, 2 billion people is increasing. As President Lagos was saying, in Latin America, Asia, and probably in Africa, there will be a massive explosion of middle class, which is good news. Yeah. But by the year 2030, there will be 5 billion people, which implies that 60% of the total population of the world will live in cities by 2030. So the point for the commission is like this. If we are going to build those cities, it's better for us to build them in the right way, to build them in affordable conditions for the economy and for the climate as well. That implies that better designing, but implies uh, isolated houses implies new rules regarding massive transportations and so on. Is that a future for us? It's going to be an incredible increase in vehicles. By the year uh, 2010, 1 billion vehicles. By the year 2050, there will be 3 billion, 5 billion vehicles. How many, how many vehicles we have? It's not possible to grow in that way. So we need a different way to do things. So basically, another, the people Currently, more than 3 million people are dying from air pollution in the world, even without considering the people dying inside the, their houses due to very poor conditions. Well, this is about the models of uh, the cities. You can see in this axis the density, and in this vertical axis the annual gasoline use per capita. So you can see some very <laughs> dense cities like Hong Kong, which is, I'm not suggesting to live in that way, the packet way to live. But maybe there is the European style, which is fancy, some more clearly ready way in which the density it has a great combination with the intense, uh, intensity of the use of gasoline. But what about the American cities? What about Boston, for instance? You can see Boston over there, oh, or Washington, D.C., or Houston, which implies an incredible consumption of gasoline. So taking now the economic and public policy decision regarding urbans, 
We will have a part of the solution of carbon emission reductions that we need with economic development. Uh, even we can estimate, if we follow the Swedish model with more density, or we follow the US model, there will be incredible differences that we need to, we need to avoid with the decision at global level. Moving, other, promoting structural changes in energy. Fortunately, renewable energy is growing in an amazing, in an amazing way, more, almost 300% only in this century. Basically, it's wind energy and basically solar energy are registering the highest uh, rates of percentage of growth, which is good. But still today, this kind of renewable energy only implies less than 4% of the total source of energy. We need to increase that. Now, what are the goods and the bad news of <coughs> about this? Bad news. The proposed new, uh, let, me, let me back to say that uh, if you analyze the big enemy, I would say, it could be coal, yeah. which implies 41 percent. Oh my god, what is happening with this? <laughs> I need to be a little, little bit less enthusiastic, but coal is, <laughs> is the big enemy. It's most of the emissions are coming from coal. So the bad news are coming from this side. If you analyze the proposed new coal power capacity, that is the case of India, and that is the case of China. So one of the key issues we need to reach is how to avoid such expansion of coal projects providing the Chinese and Indian governments with alternatives. Mm -hmm. and, and the key issue, there are several scenarios in which we are looking in which moment coal emissions in China will reach a peak and then start to descend. That's one issue. Good news on the other side is renewable. <coughs> if you see the cost of uh, wind power, the cost is going down dramatically due to technology. And there will be a point that coal, that wind energy will be cheaper than coal. And in some, some cases, it's cheaper already, depending on the price of natural gas here in the United States. And that's the same case of solar. So solar has coming down from $400 uh, could be dollars megawatt hour uh, on, a few years ago to only like less than $100 megawatt, which implies huge changes in technology that, again, solar will be cheaper or could be cheaper than coal and gas. That's a good news. The bad news is, the, the good news, again, is the global or the energy revolution here in the state re relating to shale gas and fracking is providing the cheapest natural gas in the world in Japan, the natural gas could, could be like $16 per million of BTUs. In the United States, it's like 3 to $4 million of BTUs. The same case in Mexico. Good news, what? Because natural gas will defeat coal in the United States. The bad news is natural gas could defeat renewables as well. So we need to work in order to improve the technology to, to make them even more cheaper. Other smart policies from <coughs> technology. So we need to invest. If, if I were in government again, I cannot be, but anyway, no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but we need to invest, we need to invest Just like. In case. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Don't say that because it's a very violent event. Uh, one day I will talk about the Mexican <laughs> history, but the, the, the government needs to push for, probably for three or five key disruptive technology. For instance, batteries. That is crucial. And if we need to put or all our resources, maybe we need to put in those kind of research. Uh, there are some quite interesting issues. <clears throat> What's happened with technical change? That's a very relevant issue for the debate. For some people, with the case of Porter, policy promotes innovation that reduces the cost of regulation. That is true. With the right incentives, you can afford the cost of the change. But even more, it's not only a question just to pay the cost of the dance. You can get, again, economic growth more than the cost of the innovation, because innovation provides competitiveness and profitability. And that's a key issue that a lot of people are ignoring. If you push with the right public policies innovation, you will have in, uh, positive effects in the economy re regarding with competitiveness. The clearest example of that is energy efficiency. You have a factory 
and you are able to reduce the intensity of uh, carbon of your production, you will get less cost, which implies more profits. Actually, when all those policies in Europe and other parts started uh, putting incentives regarding renewable, for instance, or some barriers like tax carbon or, or market cap for carbon, the innovation started to provide better and better uh, results regarding renewable energy. Or this amazing case. Look at this. It's a beautiful card. I prefer the blue one, but anyway. It's a Tesla. <laughs> Tesla is a vehicle, maybe you know it, but it's able to travel 400 kilometers with one single charge of electricity. And Tesla, look, the, but again, don't talk about carbon emissions. Talk about profits. Talk about market cap. The price of the company right now in the market. What is the price of General Motors? The market cap of General Motors is almost 56, 56 billion, let's say $60 billion. Selling almost 10 million vehicles a year. Tesla has a price of 30 billion, more than the half selling only 25,000 uh, 25, cars. So again, there are activities good for the environment that are an incredible businesses. So we need to promote the new economy exactly in this way. Forestry, as President was saying, is crucial. And I, I'm dealing with our colleague, uh, fellow members of the Commission, the British, which are very enthusiastic about climate change, but they Probably we are not providing the real importance to forestry. Again, Chile is an incredible success, I, as, final, as Finland, as Norway. And we need to make forestry profitable. There are several ways to do that. One is forestry itself, which is the special, specialization of Chile. Other is, for instance, that the problem first. We are losing 50 soccer fields each minute in the world. And that is probably 20% of the total carbon emissions in the world. So this morning, we have lost how many? Probably 500 <laughs> soccer fields this morning in this event. Now, there are very successful examples. Look at this hill in Korea, for instance, in the 60s and 2000s. It is possible to recover forestry. And the good news is, as long as you are recovering forestry, you are capturing carbon <laughs> and storing carbon. And you see, real mechanism to tackle climate change in developing countries in Africa or Latin America. Look at the case of Costa Rica, for instance. You can see the evolution of the cover of the forestry in Costa Rica in the 40s. Like all, all our countries, a uh, devastating process, a very irresponsible one. But where in Mexico, even in the 80s, there was a commission with an incredible budget coming from the federal government, and the aim of the commission was deforestating. That was the name <laughs> of the commission. The, the, the aim was to provide all the land for agricultural purposes, erasing the rainforest and the woods in Mexico. That's incredible. But anyway, Costa Rica lived exactly the same process. However, Costa Rica started to apply uh, payment on environmental services just to protect him the forest. And what happened in the 90s to up to date? So Costa Rica started to recover the coverage, and now 52% of the surface of the territory is covered by forest again. And that is implying, which is quite interesting thing, which is 25,000 jobs a year. Green jobs, because Costa Rica is among the leaders in ecotourism. That's one economic activity different from forestry itself. Oh, they're promoting double green revolution. We need to feed those five, nine billion people by 2050. So we need to produce more food in the same or less surface, which implies a double green revolution. The green revolution, as you know, was named the revolution that provided more productivity to the, to the farms in the 60s and 70s. It started in Mexico, by the way. And double green because this time needs to be friendly with the environment. Some examples. Well, I will skip this because very complicated slide. Pal oil. If you see all the products in a grocery store, from soap to oil or whatever, 50% of all those products are related with palm oil, which is incredible. Now, one way to do that is this model designed for one of the members of the commission, which is Paul Polman, who is Paul Polman. He say, well, in the past, especially, for instance, Indonesia, or the same case of Brazil, yeah. 
people are deforestating in order to plant palm oil, which is the worst case scenario, probably. But now we have degraded land, and we can plant palm oil instead, and we can recover that forest. Not forest exactly in the original way, but we can get in uh, green areas capturing uh, carbon emissions. What are these companies, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, and Nestle are doing? They are organizing like a supply chain in which they have a commitment in which those companies only will buy palm oil coming from certified plantations, which is fantastic. So in this way, uh, the area, the plantation area certified is growing, but nevertheless, they are buying only 16% up to date. But if we reach 80% of all the total purchases of palm oil coming only from certificated plantation, we will make a huge difference in the world. Another, well, finally, I, I want to end with this. We need to, to make bold signals from in the economic field. And one of the most important is related with fossil fuels. We need to remove fossil fuels in the world. More than 500 million uh, a year, billions, I'm sorry, are dedicated to fossil fuel, which is stupid. And only less than 100% related with renewable subsidies. We need to change that equation. We need to remove fossil fuels. And even in the future, we need to think about how to put the right economic incentives to promote this green growth, the part with low carbon part. Another could be for carbon tax or carbon mechanism. I know this is very controversial. But anyway, my point, and I, f I will finish with this, is it is possible. What well, is related with cost? There is a huge debate. Don't get involved in this, but you, for every dollar we can spend today, if we don't do that, we will need to spend almost $5 in the future paying the cost. But let's finish with my conversation here. The point is like this. Climate change is happening. It's threatening the human being. Climate change is correlated with global warming. And global warming is correlated with carbon emissions. Uh, and indeed, carbon emissions are correlated with human behavior. We can reduce carbon emissions. But in order to do that, we need not only to provide the scientist evidence to the global community. We need to provide economic arguments demonstrating that it is possible to get economic growth, job creations, and poverty alleviation, meanwhile tackling cl climate change. So that is what the new climate economy is about. So thank you for your invitation. Thank you very much to both of you. So uh, as I said with, at the outset, we're running behind. We can go five to seven minutes. So to take a round of questions, what I think I'll do is just take all the questions I'm able to and then give both President's a chance to quickly respond, okay? So I see Monica Araya. Maybe say who you are quickly and keep yes. your question short, please. Um, I'm Monica Araya from Costa Rica. I used to be a negotiator. Um, I'm an economist, and I do believe in the power of economics to, to communicate the need for change. However, um, I do look around in Latin America, and I do not see any politicians standing up to vested interests. So my question is, who is going to take this kind of analysis and turn it into a political argument? Because you can put numbers, you can bring the economists, but if a company has disproportionate power in Congress, a lot of politicians choose silence, even though they know that the country would be better off with change. So the question is, how do we connect the economics of climate change, which as you laid out, are very powerful with the politics of climate change. Where do we start making this Great. Decision? Thank you. Okay, let's take this question. Did you have a hand up here? Yes, yes you. Sir. Yes, hi. Uh, David King, uh, Foreign Secretary Special Representative on Climate Change from the UK. Um, I, I want to comment on uh, technology. Uh, Professor Lagos mentioned that technology is different today compared with 100 years ago, and President Calderon also uh, and emphasize the changing uh, face of technology and how these curves are coming down so the technology is cheaper than gas or coal, and then we are winning the economic argument. 
<clears throat> the, the technologies, as you showed, that are becoming cheaper are wind and photovoltaics. <coughs> the missing technology, which you also mentioned, is large-scale energy storage. And there's a group of us in the UK who are now pushing for a large commitment to <coughs> deployment and research and development in large-scale energy storage. We believe this would be the, the, the real ground changer for countries like uh, India, Africa, for countries which have a lot of solar energy or a lot of wind. Base load electricity can be provided with those renewables if we have large-scale energy storage. We would like to see rich countries committing 0.02% of GDP to focused research and deployment to uh, break this particular deadline. Be interesting to have your comments. Okay, great. I See, question here, question here, and then back here, and that'll have to be it, because we've got a, an 11 o'clock live streaming from Bonn, Germany coming in, so we can't delay that. Yes. Thank you. Alejandro Rivera, Mexican negotiator for uh, UNFCCC. You mentioned, President Calderon, about the false dilemma, and we are very much indeed looking forward to the report in September that will come up. But I was wondering if you can give us a heads up a little bit uh, on an example of decoupling economic growth from emissions. We analyzed economic growth in the last few years and we have seen that in times of financial crisis emissions do come down, but as a result of lower economic activity. And I think if we are able to see it or to learn an example about an example that shows this decoupling, that would tell uh, the story the right way. Thank you. Yes, down here. Hi. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Lisa Friedman. I'm a reporter with Climate Wire in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for doing this. I, I wanted to ask um, the two of you what maybe your, your measure for a successful 2015 agreement is. <coughs> if, if the pledges that governments put on the table starting early next year um, don't add up to two degrees, if, to, to keeping the world below a two degree threshold, is that still a successful? Is that still a success? You two degrees, you say? If, if the pledges don't add up to, to two degrees, to keeping countries below, to keeping the world below the two degree threshold, is that 2015 agreement still a successful one? Is, is there a different, is that the measure of success or is it something else? Oh, And then uh, Brian Ross and Oxfam America. Thank you. Yeah, yes, I'm Brian Ross. I'm with Oxfam. And uh, thank you for your comments and also for uh, We've, been, we've had the privilege of working with you in, in prior events such as in Cancun, so thank you. Uh, my question is about the Green Climate Fund and how you view its importance to achieving some of the goals that you laid out today, such as in negotiations or in triggering uh, you know, investment in economic improvements and technologies. Great. Would uh, President Lacos, would you like to uh, yeah. respond first? Well, with regard to, with regard to uh, Monica, we to say, what about po politicians? It, it seems to me that part of the presentation that uh, President Calderon showed us is becoming part of the discussion. There is a new manager of energy in Chile with the new administration. He came from the private sector, and he discovered that if you transform all the public bulbs that we have in the streets in Chile to lead, we will say the equivalent to a plant of 400 mega, 400 megas. If you want to build today a plant of 400 megas, it will cost you at least 600 billion. How much will cost? to transform the bulbs to leads, it's going to be above 300 million. That, that's the kind of, and, and he is very much in, impressed for this. Now, the other thing is, let me tell you uh, another political example that I'm against. Finally, they accepted that you, as the owner of a house, can use your house to have a solar panel, a photovoltaic, and in the same link that you receive electricity, you send back electricity. Beautiful. 
what was approved by the Chilean Congress? Net billing instead of net metering. What they mean, net billing? That they will pay you, that has a modest house and a hot platform, the same amount of money that you pay to that that is producing 1,000 megas per year in a huge dam. Can you imagine that idea of a net billing? You will get uh, 50 cents, and in the night you will pay for the same amount of electricity, one dollar. Okay. Instead of that, you go from net billing to net metering, is quite different. What is the advantage of this? That in that case, the battery, the storage of the electricity that you are producing is the grip, the power grip. <coughs> and that means that if you are producing renewable sources of energy from wind or from uh, solar, then you don't put water, take water from the dam, you don't put coal at the geothermic, or you don't use gas or oil. In other words, is the grip the one that is going to be the storage? Therefore, I think the most expensive part in renewable sources is how you're going to storage. If you have a model by which when the one that you are producing that thing goes straight to the being used, it's for free. So that's, that's the kind of thing that I do believe now politicians are beginning to think about. And that's why I think it's so important that examples that are being provided in the, in the six different areas that in, in, in Calderon's report will be coming. And this, to some extent, explains the question of storage and batteries that you mentioned. You, you have that in Europe, in, in a sense that, to some extent, you know, that the, if you are producing wind, then it goes straight and the grip is, is essential. Now, but still I do believe that in the long, long run, especially thinking in electric cars and things like that, the storage will be a very, very important, and the batteries, and I think that lithium and some other elements may be really a technological uh, breakthrough. Uh, the only example of the coupling that I know is the case of Sweden, that I understand that Sweden during the last uh, 30 years has been able to have a a growth of about 30% uh, of uh, GDP, and the emissions decreased 7%. Mm -hmm. Once I give this example, and somebody told me in the audience, yes, but to do that, you have to be Swedish. <laughs> 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 so I do not know if that may be a good answer. Uh, well, the, 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 the questions about the, the, the two degrees uh, threshold, well, it's difficult to say, yes, we have to keep that. I would say, yes, we have to keep that. But that is implicit in a sense that, apparently, nobody will tell you for sure that if you increase to three, to three degrees, it's going to be terrible or nothing will happen. I mean, what are the chances? You are 100% sure that with two degrees, nothing will happen. With three degrees, you have no idea. It may be. But then, uh, as, as uh, Nick Stern was uh, saying, would you be willing to make uh, the chances for the planet being able to survive to a 50% chance? <laughs> that, that's the point, you know. I mean, I think that science is not so exact. It's just an approximation. And they say 2% because they feel secure with 2%. If some of them feel unsecure, then where would you go? And, and uh, well, that would be my comments on the, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I, I plenty agree with President Lagos, uh, and I, well, probably I should add some points about that. Uh, one is, I, I will, let the first one to the last, because we'll be more passionate about that. Uh, I agree, but I'm sorry about what I said about the bridge. It was a joke only, you know, that I really appreciate the leadership of uh, the United Kingdom in this. And actually, 
the new climate economy on uh, the global commission is proposed <coughs> by was proposed by uh, uh, countries including the UK Sweden Norway and also uh, South, South Korea, Malaysia, Colombia, and Ethiopia, but the UK has playing an incredible role in that, and I really express, I want to express my gratitude on that. I agree with the energy storage problem. Very close here in MIT, they are developing quite interesting project, probably you know that, that regarding some kind of this magical, like a, it's like a, how do you say it, like a research question, or something like that, I don't understand about engineering, but something related with bio elements co elements coming from biology mixed with engineering and bioengineering areas they are addressing the issue and there is a, a doctor and she is developing a quite interesting battery regarding the this key issue I agree with that but even there are other ways in which regardless the advance of technology and I agree with your proposal about advocating specific funds for that other measures regarding us. One is the president. What the president Lagos said, we apply that in Mexico. Uh, the we we call the reversible measures, medidor yeah. reversible, and we jump this structural problem regarding with batteries. But the really high costs are not the solar panels, which which price is decreasing dramatically, yeah. but the batteries. And once we got that the CFE, the public utility accepted the reversible measures, we are gaining that battle. And I agree, it was going to be a fantastic way in which we can promote that kind of uh, development. The other is some very uh, funny or innovative measures. For instance, in Spain, the companies are generating energy with wind. Uh, and when the wind is flowing, they are pumping up the yeah. water to the dam again. And so the energy actually is reserved in the, in the dam. And we can uh, multiply such kind of examples uh, besides the advances in, in batteries itself. Uh, the coupling emissions, I agree with President again. It is possible that you analyze the data, not only of Sweden, but there are a lot, of, a lot of European countries that are getting economic growth and are reducing carbon emissions. If we understand that as a coupling, because of course, if you analyze the historical correlation, there is a correlation between emissions and economic growth, but that is not the point. The point is where, how can you get economic growth reducing your carbon emissions? Another example, the United States. The United States, of course, is now because the government or the Congress wanted to do that, but it's happening due to the revolution in shale gas. As long as the American economy is going into carbon, in, into natural gas instead of carbon or oil, there are a clear reduction or decoupling, if we can say that, uh, in terms of uh, carbon emissions. So that is the goal, and it is the point. And the measures we are exploring are exactly that. Again, all not regrets measures that are profitable and good for the environment. We need to build three trillion uh, public works in infrastructure. It's better to do it the right way. And it implies decisions like, are we going to build more avenues, second floors for vehicles, or we want to, to, to build massive infrastructure for massive transportation, we need to choose right now the second. Uh, cities, energy, land use, agriculture, forestry, it's another way, it's clearly for developing countries. Latin America is key, you know, as the president said. You can get economic growth and jobs, and even reducing carbon emissions, sequestrating or storage in carbon uh, the other is, as I, uh, I will add to the suggestion about batteries, the other technological innovation really needed is, is carbon capture and storage. It's very expensive, but I cannot imagine this transition from carbon towards rational way without carbon storage, honestly. So we need to push a little, a lot of that. Uh, now, points regarding the goals. Yes, could be if we agree two percent, which we got two percent in Cancun. It was one of the best outcomes of the of the meeting. The other was Red Plus and others. But now, I, I the point as President was saying is not the formal goals we are establishing. That's a key issue, yes. But the key issue is the public policies that we need to put in place. For me, for instance, it could be a real success if we got a formal commitment to eliminate subsidies in fossil fuels. 
And if we establish some commitment regarding carbon tax, it would be better. But just eradicating fossil fuels would be great. What is the problem for to do that? It's not an economic problem for the government, because even eradicating fossil fuels, you can get more public revenues, which is all any government is looking for that. The problem is related with the political cost of removing fossil fuels. Uh, when I reestablish the gradual increase in price of gasoline in Mexico, I, uh, there was not very cooperative attitude from the opposition claiming that the president is raising the price of gas, so gasoline and so on. So I paid the political cost. Uh, now the new government is, uh, is doing the same or even more, um, but fortunately today we have a m more responsible a more cooperative opposition. This is a, a, a needed measure. But we can design, and that's a task for centers like these, so for students and teachers, public policy. What could be the way in which you can remove subsidies by compensating the people? And the, for instance, the theoretical framework is you could pay conditional cash transfer focused on the families that really need it, because with these subsidies to gasoline, for instance, we are subsidizing this fancy lady with a very big SUV, you know, uh, going everywhere. But she doesn't need it because she's very rich, actually. And the people who need the subsidies are really poor people. Actually, they have not car, they have not car at all. So. We need to provide a subsidy to the poorest families in a, in a very direct manner with a lease with a, uh, uh, of beneficiaries instead of the flat uh, subsidy to the gasoline or, or the oil or whatever. That's one point. The other, we need to explore some kind of optional alternative. If you want to get your subsidy in the traditional way, this is, there is a coupon, for instance. Or, or, but, we need to, but if not, you can get the money by cash or whatever, or, but we need to put more difficulties for the people in order to reduce the traditional way. But that's my point about that. Finally, uh, arguments on politics. My first point is we need to jump from the environmental arguments in which, honestly, most of the people, most of the leader, unfortunately don't care. I care about that. So we need to jump into the economic arguments. I'm a politician all my life almost since I was a child. <laughs> but any, no one politician is fighting against votes. So we need to translate our arguments in votes. We need to translate our arguments in jobs. We need to translate our arguments in economic growth. It's difficult, yes, but it's a key issue. And finally, we need to remember that in politics, people matters. We need to call upon the support of public opinion for that. And we need to win this battle facing the vested interests with the best interests of the people. And that is the task for politician and leadership. That is leadership about. You need to move people and resources in favor of the good causes, in favor of the good reasons. We have a very powerful motive. We Still today, we have very poor arguments, public opinion. We need to improve that. But after that, with the right arguments, and that is the question about IPCC reports, the summit called for... Uh, by Ban Ki-moon, September, the COP. Uh, by the way, not the COP in Paris. That's another mistake we are making. To so this idea that we are going to reach a fancy agreement in mm. such fancy city like Paris. Oh, my God. <laughs> Flavor. <laughs> no, come on. We have Peru before. Let's go to Lima. Let's go do that. Exactly <laughs> that. No? So we need to do that. But we need to fight. We are politicians. It's going to be a pleasure to fight again, no? isn't it? We have no option. <laughs> we can do it. That's my idea. Okay, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking the former president.